Good evening. Thank you for joining us for our last midweek Lenten devotion in the year of 2020. I'm Pastor Mike Cherney, and it is my privilege to be able to share God's Word with you this evening. The lesson that we're going to be focusing on for tonight's devotion comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 11 to 19, if you'd like to follow along in a Bible. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, my dear brother, my dear sister in Christ. You are not alone. Maybe that's obvious to you. If you're watching with someone, with your kids, or you're listening on the podcast with someone next to you, all you have to do is look to your right or to your left, and you know you're not alone. If your family is not with you, or if you aren't married and you don't have kids, all you have to do is open up your phone, look at your most recent calls or texts, go on social media, the people that you've interacted with today. You know that you're not alone. But no matter what your case may be, you know what it feels like to feel alone. What are the moments in your life when you feel the most alone. Maybe it's when you're surrounded by people, but no one seems to be taking an interest in what's going on with you, what's, what's going on in your life. Maybe you can come up with a time when you were really going through something and there was no one around who seemed willing enough to give you an encouraging word, or some helpful advice. Maybe you feel alone when you're the only person who has the interests that you do, so you feel like you stand out. You feel like you don't fit in. It's whenever you feel like you don't have a community to belong to. You don't have a family to call your own. You don't feel like you have a group. Well, if you ever felt that way, my brother, my sister in Christ, I'm excited to share Paul's words with you this evening. Because you're not alone. As Paul says, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. You are not alone. The Spirit of God dwells in you. And God put His Spirit in you when you first came to faith, when you were baptized for many of us, or when you heard God's Word for the first time. And God made a believer out of you. God's Spirit dwells within you, so you know you are never alone, because God is always with you. You do belong to a group. You do belong to a community. You belong to the community of the family of faith. You belong to the, the group of anyone who has ever believed in the true Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You are not alone. But now that you are part of this group, now that you are in this family, now that you are in this community, Paul says there is an expectation, there is an obligation for the way that you and I act and live. He continues to say, Therefore, brothers and sisters, fellow people who share the faith in Jesus Christ, we have an obligation. But is it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. We have an obligation. Now that the Spirit of God lives within you and me, our actions matter. We have a decision to make. We have an obligation to keep in step with that spirit, to walk accordingly with that spirit and not according to the flesh. 
You see, while we dwell on this sinful earth and while we inhabit these sinful bodies corrupted by sin, we still have a nature within us that desires to sin. Not until these bodies pass away and we're taken up to be with God forever in heaven will we be free from our sinful nature. We will always have desires to do what is wrong. And someone might say, well, if God gave us his spirit, if God made us new, if God it dwells within us with his Holy Spirit, is this really freedom? Is this really independence if we can't, if there's a certain way we have to act, if we can't think for ourselves? Well, what if God did give us carte blanche to just do whatever we ever wanted? And then what if we followed that sinful nature? Because sin leads to death. Sin is dangerous. Following the path of the flesh, following what the flesh desires, that's not good. So Paul says we have an obligation. You are not alone. The Spirit lives within you. So what you and I are supposed to do with the eyes of faith, we are supposed to take a bird's eye view and look at our actions, look at our desires and our wants and our hopes, and ask the question, is this me following what the Spirit desires? Is this me following what I should do according to what God says in His Word? Or is this me following my own sinful flesh? And if it is following our sinful flesh, you know what awaits us. Sin earns death. The penalty for sin is death, spiritual death. So now that you and I have the Spirit of God, and now that we belong to this new group, and now that we're supposed to act accordingly, we won't justify sin. We won't flirt with temptation. We won't look at the things that our Lord calls lust or greed or envy or hatred or gossip and say, you know what, I don't think that's a big deal. Now that we have the Spirit of God, we have an obligation to be honest about what, where our motivations lie. We have an obligation to put to death the deeds of the flesh. My brother and my sister. When I think about my record, when I think about my life, when I take that bird's eye view and look at all the decisions that I've made, the words that I've spoken, and the actions that I have done, I see a lot more following the flesh than following the spirit. How about you? What does your past look like? Have we done more living as fellow believers, as, as children of faith? Or do our actions speak more about us as followers of the flesh? of the sinful nature. And are we going to get what we deserve for our sin? Let's read on. For those who are led by the Spirit are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. Again, rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. I really enjoyed talking with a, a bunch of members of Trinity and other members of the community about the hidden blessings to this crazy situation that we're in right now. There are many different silver linings but one of them is that the star test was canceled for the year. 
you know, I never had to take the STAR test when I was in grade school or middle school, but I gotta say, from the kids that I've talked to and the parents with children who are in this school system who have to take the STAR test, it sounds awful. <laughs> when I hear students talk about the way, that, the way that they feel about the STAR test, I just hear things of stress and anxiety because the kids go to school and they hear the teachers really hype this up. The STAR test is very, very important. Like most standardized testing, the way that the kids do, a lot rides on that. Because then the state sees how the teachers teach and then they award money and funding accordingly. It's a performance-based experience. You got to do well because a lot's riding on this. Is God your star test administrator? Is God a teacher standing over your desk looking at your test waiting to see how you're going to do? Is your status with God dependent on your performance? Is God waiting for you to impress him? No. God does not have his grade book out. He is not your teacher about to give you an F for all the sins you and I have committed. God is not an employer who is going to give us a performance review at the end of the month. God is not, like Paul says, a slave master who is sitting there barking orders at you and me, only waiting for us to follow in blind obedience. No, God, through faith in him, is your father. Now, what's the difference? Fathers, when they do their job, when we do our job, I should say, foster a relationship of love, of peace, of security, and not of fear. When fathers do their job, they show their children that they don't have to worry. A good father, at the end of the day, will say to their kids, leave it up to me, I will take care of it. A good father, when fatherhood is done right, they will provide for their family, they will be there for their children, and they love their children and show it in myriad ways. We human fathers mess up. We sin and we fail in our God-given vocation as fathers, but think of God, your perfect father. Oh, and he is your father. This is not just a metaphor. This is not just flowery image, image, imaginative language. No, God is your father because remember, he placed his spirit within you. He has won you into his family through faith because God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. And when Jesus was shedding his blood on that cross, he was paying the adoption price to purchase you as a member of his family, welcome to the family of God. You have entered for free through nothing you had to do. Simply trust in God, your Father, who does it all. He loves you. All those sins you and I committed when we were too busy running after what the flesh desired, those are forgiven. Those are washed clean in the blood of your brother, Jesus Christ, of your Lord. You are made new. You are given a new status. You are completely forgiven. And God calls himself your father. So you can trust him. You have been united with God in a relationship of love and security and peace and comfort and confidence through what God has done for you on the cross and by sending his spirit into you to live within you. And that spirit through faith connects you to the family of God. And this is no small thing, my brother and my sister, because I can call you that because you are my brother and sister in the family of believers. Isn't that great? That you are not alone? 
that no matter what your life status is, no matter what you have going on, you know that you belong to a community, to a family, a family of people who together call God our Father, that who together rely and trust in God to take care of all things, who together recognize that God is in control, that God is love incarnate, that God is the one who loves us perfectly. And, as if that weren't enough, Paul continues, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may share in his glory. An heir has a lot to look forward to. An heir to an estate or to a kingdom will look forward to inheriting great things, big, big important things. Because through faith, through the spirit that lives within you, you've been connected to what Christ has gone through for you. You have been purchased by the suffering of Christ. You also are guaranteed that you will share in Christ's glory. The way that Christ was raised from the dead and glorified and now he sits at the right hand of God, you too can look forward to your resurrection, your glorification. You know how your story ends. It ends with you in heaven with God forever. Paul continues and he says, I consider that our present suffering are not worth comparing with the glory that will re be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. What questions do you have right now? What questions are bothering you at this very moment? When is this going to end? When am I going to get back to work? When our grocery store is going to be fully stocked again? How long am I going to have to stay home? When can I return back to life as normal? All these unknowns can be quite stressful, can cause quite a bit of worry. In moments of worry, in moments of stress, let's focus on what we know for sure. We know how this all ends. We know that there is a future glory waiting for us that isn't just better than what we're going through right now. To say that the glory waiting to be revealed in us through faith in Christ Jesus, to say that that is better than this life, is an infinite, infinite understatement. Paul says it is not worth even comparing the glory that will be revealed, to, revealed in us to the sufferings we're going through right now. Whatever you're going through, whether it's coronavirus related or not, it doesn't even compare. You can't even put it side by side with the glory that has already been prepared for you in Christ with the glory that already awaits you and it has your name on it guaranteed in Christ. And you are not alone. You are not alone in awaiting with eagerness, with eager expectation, this glory that's going to be revealed. Paul says, even creation itself is eagerly awaiting this glory. Even creation itself is waiting for the end of the story to be finally realized. You are not alone. You are part of a community of people who together look forward to the inheritance of eternal glory that is made, made real for us in Christ. You are not alone because you belong to a family of people who together rest their trust in God, our Heavenly Father. You are not alone because God, who 
sent his spirit to dwell within you, is with you every day, every moment. The one who said, never will I leave you nor forsake you, he's with you right now. He speaks to you every day through his word. He has not forgotten about you. He knows you more than you could ever realize. And he loves you more than you will ever know. Until until you see him in glory in heaven forever and you see him as he is and you join everyone else who has put their faith in the one true God you are not alone now you won't be alone then so God bring us to that day for Jesus sake amen let's pray Lord God, our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for winning for us forgiveness and salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for connecting us to that forgiveness and salvation through your Spirit, whom you give to us freely through sacrament and the Word. Keep us strong in this faith, Lord. Send your Holy Spirit into our hearts and strengthen our faith every day through the reading and the talking about your Word. Help us to remain confident in the promise of glory that is ours, which you tell us about in your word. Help us to recognize that we are not alone, that you are with us always, and that you have united us in glory and mercy and love to a family of faith. Thank you for this family, Lord. Help us to encourage each other. Be there for one another. And let each other know that we're not alone that we're there for each other, that ultimately you are there for us. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us for our final Lenten devotion this week. We hope that God blessed you through the, the sharing of his word. Please leave a, leave a comment or subscribe or like if you're watching on YouTube. Share this video with someone who you think would benefit from, from hearing it. We would love to get the word out there so that more and more people know that we're not alone. And more and more people know about what Christ has done for all of us. Thank you again, and God bless you. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.